welcome everyone to the to today's uh, smart grid seminar. Our speaker today is Zhechen Wang. He is a uh, PhD student in the Department of Civil and Engineering, Environmental Engineering. Uh, he is going to talk about a project, a very interesting project, uh, in which they use uh, satellite images to determine the locations of distributed energy resources, in particular solar insulation and grid infrastructure. And uh, just a quick reminder, we will have another, uh, with, uh, our next seminar is next week. Uh, Professor Ines Asvedo is, is going to talk about uh, the system module factors. And, and after that, uh, who is uh, Shaban is going to talk about EV charging behavior. That, that should be very interesting. So our speaker today is uh, the person who I'm, he's a PhD student in civil and environmental engineering with a minor in computer science. His uh, supervisors are Professor Ram Rajagopal and Professor Arun Matunda. His interest, his research interests uh, in machine learning, sustainability, and social science. Uh, in particular, he's, he's, he, he aimed at development of AI-driven methods to provide closer solutions for building sustainable urban and energy systems. Uh, he received his Bachelor in Energy and Power Engineering from Tsinghua University in 2016 and Master in Mechanical Engineering from Stanford. Hey everyone, thank you for being here today. I'm Zhe Chen Wang from Civil and Environmental Engineering. Today I'm going to talk about the Energy Atlas, which is machine learning based mapping for the distributed energy resources as well as their interaction with infrastructure and communities. And uh, Atlas means a collection of maps. And uh, the background picture shows in this slide shows an example of Atlas. It is called the Atom Orbit Terror. It is considered as the first modern Atlas of the world. It was published in 1570. So we can see how people had already done an excellent job in mapping our Earth even four centuries ago. So why do we need another Atlas for the Earth today? Especially, why do we need an energy atlas? That is because our Earth is undergoing a drastic change, actually, not towards a good direction. The climate becomes warming. And uh, there are numerous evidence shows that human activities are a major cause of the climate change over the past century. When we get faster transportation, cheaper energy, we also get higher temperature. The climate change can harm humans in turn, either directly or indirectly through our infrastructures. Because our infrastructures were vulnerable, were not originally designed to adapt to such a climate change. So the climate change will increase the frequency of extreme weather, which will pose severe pressure on our infrastructures like power grid. There will be more power crises and more white fires ignited by power lines. To tackle the climate change, we are trying to decarbonize our energy sector by introducing more renewable resources. Solar and wind have been growing rapidly in the past decades in the global electricity generation. And if you reach the climate goal, it is projected to grow even faster in the future. However, our world is never homogenous, especially during drastic transitions. We are living in a world will advance clean energy technologies such as rooftop solar, electric vehicle, and home batteries are rapidly penetrating the life of wealthy people. Meanwhile, there are still a billion people in the world lacking the basic access to electricity. Even in the US, where there is rich energy resources and a 100% electrification rate, there are still over 30% of households reporting different kinds of energy insecurity like the challenge of paying energy bills or suffering from frequent power disconnections. Let's further zoom in to California, a state with relatively high average income level, strong solar radiations, and good policies for solar so for solar installations. Still, for a lot of locations, there are still significant barriers for those communities to install solar. And the barriers come not just from the their economic ability, but also from their local infrastructures. The hosting capacity of the power grid or the solar PV over there could be as less as zero or less than 1.5 kilowatts. 
That means that even the local people want to install solar, can afford solar, the local power grid does not have enough capacity to host the solar. So that's why we need to zoom in to a highly granular level to investigate the heterogeneity across places, across communities. And that is the first step before we can figure out a conclusive and uh, equitable pathway for every community. Besides the spatial variation, temporal change also matters a lot. Here, we show how different technologies have been adopted among population over time, like the telephone, refrigerator, and the internet. And they are usually adopted by a few pioneers at the beginning, then the speed ramped up and ramped down. And finally, the adoption got saturated. So we also want to know how this type of curves look like for renewable energy. We are interested in who adopted first, but more and concerned about who are left behind. So temporal change is also very important. And besides the spatial and temporal variation, the energy transition also poses a technical challenge to the power grid, because our power grid was not initially designed to adapt to the transition. A critical rule of power grid is that supply must meet demand at any time. This works well during the era of conventional energy. But when a large portion of it is replaced by the renewable energy, things have changed. Because renewable energy are intermittent, unstable, they highly depend on weather. When they're connected to the, to the power grid, they can cause the instability to the entire system. So we also want to get the transparency of the renewable energy and the connections to the power grid. However, unlike conventional power plants, renewable energy are more decentralized and distributed. For solar PV, they can be installed on numerous residential building rooftops or hidden behind the electricity meter of individual households. It's challenging to know where they are, what the capacities are, and how they have been deployed over time. On the energy distribution and transmission side, there are also challenges. Transmission grid is a chunk of the power system to carry power from the power plants to substations, and we have rather comprehensive information on them. But for distribution grid, they are the branches of the power grid. They carry power from the substations to individual consumers. They are more distributed and managed by different co utility companies separately. And even utility companies themselves may not exactly know their information, like their locations, their connectivities, and their status, like whether they're on the ground or overhead. We care about whether they're overhead or on the ground is because overhead power lines are one of the major causes for destructive wildfires. It costs a lot of areas to be burned every year. And the wildfires can harm power grid in turn by either reducing the line capacities or completely damaging the power lines. However, unfortunately, all these information are owned by different, are kept in a large number of data silos. For example, in the US, there are thousands of utility companies, solar companies, regulatory agencies, and different organizations. Each one, uh, have their own data, which is not accessible to others. So is there any way to break such isolations? So one way is to let those as organizations contribute their own data. Berkeley Lab has a project called Tracking the Sun, which maintains a large scale solar PV, PV registration database covering 30 states in the US. And their data is based on the voluntary data contribution by different agencies, utilities, or the PV system participating in incentive programs. So what's the limitation? If a system was not participated in any program, or does the program does not want to report their data, then the system will not be recorded in the data set. So and we can also see that the data set has very good coverage for the regions with many incentive programs, like the West Coast or Northeast. But for regions with no program or very few programs, then the coverage is not good. So, but 
We also want to know how solar adoption are happening over these places. So given such limitations, we are wondering that if there is any way to obtain the highly granular spatial and temporal information in a non-intrusive, scalable, and generalizable way. Fortunately, there's increasing availability of heterogeneous geospatial data and remote sensing images, including satellite and aerial images of different resolutions, times, and the spectral bands. We also have street view images and a lot of public field information, geographic information for roads and buildings. On the other hand, machine learning has achieved great breakthroughs in recent decades. It could be used to automatically extract information from the road data to get information we are interested in. So we hope it can eventually help us to construct a comprehensive spatial map and the temporal changes. So in this project, we propose to construct Energy Atlas, which is a comprehensive and dynamic database for distributed energy resources, as well as their interactions with infrastructures and people. And it consists of geospatial layers from the supply side to the transmission and distribution side, and finally to the demand and people side. And in this project, we mainly focus on the spatial temporal solar PV mapping on the supply side and the fine grain distribution pre mapping on the energy distribution side and the characterization of people on the people side. And here is the outline. Let's first go to the supply side, the spatial mapping of the PV, which is called deep solar, and also the temporal mapping of PV, which is called deep solar plus plus. As we know, for solar PV to, to work, they need to expose to the sunlight. So there's a good chance to capture them from the top down view of the remote sensing images. And a straightforward way is to frame this problem as an image classification problem. That means that we can label each image with a binary label indicating whether it is positive, meaning containing solar, and the negative, meaning containing no solar. And by providing such a binary label for a lot of images and supervision, we can train a classification model uh, convolutional neural networks or classification. And actually, in practice, it can achieve good results for classification with over 90% precision and recall. And uh, even though they are in, in the real world, are, the number of negative samples is more than 100 times than the positive sample, the result is still good. But given that if an image has already been identified as positive, how do we further estimate the size in this image? We know that to provide full supervision, we need to label the, we need to allocate the solar panel size for every solar panel for a lot of solar panels to train the model. But is that, but it is super in, labor intensive. Is it possible to do it in a more efficient way? Actually, we can do it in a Weekly supervised way. Weekly supervised means that we still only provide a binary class label for training the classification, but the model can gain the size estimation ability at the same time during the same process. Let me illustrate this with a simple example. Here, we just assume most of the layers in the neural network can be regarded as a black box, but we will open it later on. But here, we just tell about the intermediate result at the very end of the network. And it is a set of matrix called a feature maps. And each feature map can be regarded as the result after multiple signal filtering and transforms. And each feature map focuses on the specific type of visual features in the image. And for classification, we just apply the average operator for each feature map and get the average and then multiply it by some weights and add them up together and get the final number. And this weight marked in red can be trained during the training process. And for classification, the final prediction is based on the final number. Like if this number is greater than the threshold, then the image is identified as positive. But what if we remove this average operator and directly apply these weights 
to the feature match after the model has already been trained, what can we get? Actually, we can get a weighted combination of the feature match, which highlights the areas of the objects we are interested in. It's called class activation map. Means that the pixels highlighted in this map are the most indicative of the class we are interested in, the solar panel. And can we improve it further? Improve it to be better for a more accurate size estimation? Now, let's open the black box to see what's inside. Actually, the results after each layer in the neural network can, is also a set of feature maps. And for each downstream layer, it extracts the features from, its up, from the output, output of its upstream layer to derive the feature map. And we can also apply the class activation map on each set of the each set of the feature maps to get the class activation map, the CAM, at a different position. And what we can find, actually, from we can find that from the from the upstream to downstream, the features that are extracted become more specific, more indicative of the class, but of lower resolution. But from the downstream to upstream, the feature becomes more complex but noisier, but of higher resolution. So there's a trade-off. To accurately estimate the size of the solar panels, we want the class activation map to be both specific and uh, of higher resolution. So we try to break the trade-off by using a training paradigm for the 3D layer-wise training. And that means that after a model, a classification model has been trained, we just freeze it and add a new layer, new convolutional layer at the middle point of, of the neural network. And we choose a rather upstream layer because we want to leverage a high resolution of features extracted over there. And we train this newly added layer for classification with only binary label as supervision. And after it has been trained, we can generate a class activation map using the feature over there. And we can see uh, compared to the original one, original one, this new one, this new class activation map has less noise, and uh, but we still don't use it. We just, we further add another convolutional layer right after this newly added layer, and also train this layer for classification. And now we get another class activation map, which is even better than the previous one. So after the with this great layer wise training, we'll force the we're we'll forcing the newly added layer to greatly extract features from the previous layer to get a better, uh, more uh, cleaner and more complete representation of the object. And we can see the class activation maps generated with a great layer wise training um, has better quality than the ones without really layer was training. It, uh, it has less noise, but keeping the completeness of the projects, uh, of the objects we're interested. And we can use it for estimating the sizes of solar panels in the image. And it can achieve the mean relative error of 3% at the aggregate level. And we finally deploy this model to over 1 billion image titles across the contiguous US to construct a nationwide solar PV data set containing 1.5 billion solar PV systems covering the US. And for each system, it consists the it contains the geolocation, size, and subtype information. And here we visualize the solar deployment rate across the US from the state level all the way down to the system level. We also developed a web-based platform to let public users to visualize, to analyze the deep source data. It provides the visualization platform interface to enable users to compile two variables at the same location simultaneously, and uh, from the state level to the sense check level. And it also provides a data analysis platform that enables users to correlate the source deployment rate with other variables like income, Gini index, 
by controlling for the third variable like the solar radiation. So the deep solar reveals the static patterns of the solar adoption, but we also want to get a temporal information to get to know, to understand the PV adoption trajectories over time and to predict the future growth of PV and to conduct causal analysis, uh, inference to analyze the intervention effects of different solar PV policies. And to do this for each image, for each solar panel, we backtrack the historical images at the location of this solar panel and get the historical images. It's like a sequence. But one challenge is that the image resolution, many historical images has so low resolution that even a human can hardly tell whether there's a solar panel in these historical images. But we know that eventually there'll be a solar panel deployed at this location. So we can use the latest images as a reference to let it compare with each one of these historical images. And with this comparison, we can tell that whether the same object also exists in each one of these historical images. And with this approach, we can identify the installation year for each solar system. And uh, to implement this comparison-based uh, strategy, we developed the scientist network, which means that uh, the, the two branches in the network with sharing the identical architecture, each branch take one image as input and the features extracted at different positions uncompared with each other between these two images using some models and the comparison can generate a similarity and the similarity can be further used to derive the final prediction. And with this model, we can actually achieve very good performance in estimating the installation year of solar PV systems. For 86% of solar PV systems, the predicted year of installation by our model is equal to the actual year of installation. And we use this model to construct the spatial temporal PV installation data set for four 20 counties across 46 states in the US. And this one is called the Deep Solar Plus Fox, and the coverage is still growing. Later on, I will show how we use this uh, solar spatial temperature data set for solar adoption and analyze and analysis over time. But now we just move on from the uh, supply side to the energy distribution side. In this section, I will introduce the uh, distribution grid mapping by combining multi model data, which is so called a deep grid. And the two major streams of the work for the distribution grid mapping and model. The first one is the distribution grid topology estimation based on the measurement state, like voltages. They assume the nodes in the distribution grid are already known, and the, the measurements at the different nodes are available. And those measurements are obtained by the smart meters deployed on the consumer side. And the final goal is that given those measurements at uh, different nodes, they want to estimate the power line connection, the connections between different nodes. But this cannot be extended to the open world because the smart meter is not widely deployed everywhere. And uh, the, we cannot, in the open world, we cannot have prior knowledge of where those nodes are. Another stream of work is for the open world distribution grid mapping. And they directly map both the geolocations and connectivities of the distribution grid from scratch, completely from scratch, by relying on some imagery data like aerial images or nightlight maps. But the problem is that for many locations, for many places, the resolution of aerial image is not high enough to detect the utility poles as well as the power lines. And the resolution of nightlight map is also low. It's only at the, around one kilometer per pixel, which is impossible for fine grain distribution grain mapping. And in comparison, 
Street view images are widely available with rather homogeneous resolution. That means that the, the method developed based on it can be more generalizable. And uh, instead of using the horizontal view of street view images, we use the upward the view of the street view images because it has much simpler, simple, uh, much simpler geometric relationship, which could greatly facilitate the estimation of the power line directions as well as the utility pole orientation. So, given those street view images, how can we derive the final on the ground uh, distribution grid map? containing not just the overhead part, but also the on-the-ground part. So we know that the on-the-ground part of the distribution grid cannot be captured by the street view images. So in, we integrate other modalities of data, like road networks and the building maps. Now, let's see how we can derive the uh, final grid map by integrating all this data. The street view images are processed by two neural networks. One is the utility pole detector, another one is power line detector. They are used to estimate the utility pole orientation as well as the line directions in the image. And then by intersecting the orientations estimated at the different street view positions, and by intersecting the rates of these orientations, we can localize the utility poles on the map. And uh, in this way, we can construct a map of the geolocations of different utility poles. And uh, our next step is want to, that we want to predict whether there's power line connection between different utility poles. And to do this, we integrate the road network as well as the line directions, the pole, locali pole localizations, and uh, derive those features for classification, like whether the two poles are on the same road, whether they're next to each other, along the road, is there any power line detected between them? And the power line angles estimated, estimated by the power line de detector. And in this way, we can develop a machine learning classifier to classify, to predict whether there is a power line between two poles. And in this way, we can construct a map of the overhead grid consisting of both the uh, utility pole locations as well as the power line, power line connections. And our final step is to derive the underground part of the grid. And to do this, our approach is heuristic. It is based on two assumptions. The first one is that buildings are more likely to connect it to the nearby grid than the grid are far apart from this. That means that we can overlay the estimated overhead grid with a building mass. And uh, we, then we want to derive those buildings that could be connected by the estimated overhead grid within a certain distance. And to do this, we virtually dilate the past, estim the, dilate the estimated overhead grid with a certain radius to cover those buildings, that means that this part of the building could be connected to the estimated overhead grid within a certain radius. And then our next assumption, our second assumption is that all buildings are connected to the grid, which means that the electrification rate is 100%, which holds in many countries. And under this assumption, those buildings that are not connected by the overhead grid must be connected to the underground grid in some way. So that means that we, if we want to estimate the on-the-ground grid, we can just find a path to connect to those unconnected buildings. So we use a graph algorithm, which is called dextrous algorithm, to connect those buildings unconnected by the overhead grid and derive those paths to connect them. And we use the, those paths as the estimation of the underground part of the grid. And this way, we can obtain an estimation of the entire grid map, including both the underground part and the overhead part. And we, to evaluate the performance, we use two metrics. One is precision, which means the fraction of the estimated distribution grid 
of which the actual distribution grids can be found within the radians R. And recall means that the breadth of actual grids, uh, actual grid that can be detected within a uh, radius R. And uh, for the five test areas in Northern California, under the R equals 30 meter, we can find the precision can be uh, 89% to 98%. And recall can also be around 80% to 90%. And uh, this model can also be extended to other regions in the world, like the Sub-Saharan Africa. We know the electricity infrastructure may not be in a good condition over these places, and we don't have much data about it. So our approach may be helpful for these places in the electricity, electricity infrastructure management and planning. And we find that without any retraining or fine tuning, our model can maintain a very good precision on these on the test errors in the sub-Saharan Africa, but the recall drops from 80% level to 70% level. Now let's move on from the energy distribution side to the people side. And in this section, I'm going to introduce the urban to vet, which is the multimodal representation learning for the communities. And we need the characteristics of community because they're important for the decision making, for the policy making. And it is essential for us to get this information to enable a people-centric energy transition. So, but how to capture the characteristics of an urban neighborhood, of a neighborhood, of a community? The common way includes the census and the survey. In the US, the census is conducted every 10 years, and it costs 15 billion, which is very high. And another approach is the American Community Survey, con also conducted by Census Bureau. For the smaller geographic units, the data is usually available by averaging over the five years, and it is based on sampling. And the cost is also very high. It costs 250 million per year. And uh, we're wondering that if there is there any way to obtain such highly granular information in a more cost efficient and generalizable way? Can we directly extract those information from the open data? Now let's look in the communities or neighborhoods. A community or neighborhood can be regarded as a container containing the local environments and the local businesses like this, restaurants and stores. And the local environments can be captured by the street view images and the local businesses, the information can be captured from the textual data on the open platform, like Yelp, at the ratings, the categories, and also their customer reviews. But how can we represent such a, such a container? As we know, an important pillar of natural language processing is to represent a word as a vector, like word to vector. And that means that uh, by just receiving the vectors, the computer can know the semantic meaning of the word itself. And uh, for example, given a document, the model will project the uh, words that are semantically similar to the, po to the uh, po positions next to each other in the vector space. For example, in this document, yield. The word Yale occurs before university, and the word Stanford also occurs before the word university. So the model will project Yale and Stanford close to each other in the vector space. And that means that if two words are semantically similar, their corresponding vectors are also close to each other in the vector space. And this has been widely applied in many applications like Google search, like given a query, it can help you obtain the, the semantically similar contents to the query. And can we leverage a similar idea? Like given a neighborhood, can we search for its top 10 most similar neighborhoods, like in a search engine? And we know that the neighborhood contains a street view. And according to the intuition of this first law of geography, 
everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. So, for example, for a street view one, it is more likely to be close, to be similar to another street view near this street view one than a street view that is far from this street view one. So, so in the vector space, the model will make the vector of street view, street view one closer to the vector of another view, street view near it, and then recalling the vector of the street view that are far from it. And we also, the model also forced the neighborhood, uh, the vector of the neighborhood closer to the vector of street views in context. And in a similar way, as the neighborhood also contains local businesses, so we can also establish the correlation between the neighborhood and the words describing the local businesses inside this neighborhood. For example, if a customer uses a word expensive to describe a restaurant in this neighborhood A, and uh, the model will like, and another word, dirty, is not associated with any local businesses in this neighborhood A. So the model will force this neighborhood A, the vector of this neighborhood A, to be closer to the vector of expensive in the vector space, but recalling the vector of the the vector of dirty. And in this way, we can derive the vector representation of urban neighborhoods by incorporating both the street view images, street view information, as well as the texture information. And that this vector representation can be used in a lot of downstream tasks as a prediction with just a simple uh, model for regression, like the prediction of demographics, and the prediction of the real estate price, a prediction of the solar adoption rate, like the number of systems per household. It can also be used to retrieve the, retrieve the similar neighborhood to a parking neighborhood. For example, for neighborhood A in Chicago, the model can retrieve the most and the least similar neighborhood in another city in New York by just leveraging the distance of vectors. And we can find the Neighborhood A and its most similar partner can show the similar demographic features like the average household income, the medium age, but the least similar neighborhood will have the different demographic features. And now we get different spatial the methodology to construct different spatial layers, but we also want to overlay one layer on another for some real world applications to solve some technical challenges or to distill some socioeconomic insights. For example, by combining the solar PV map, distribution grid map, and the nature and the solar radiation map, we can estimate the solar energy on the power grid to facilitate the renewable energy integration. And by combining the solar PV map and the characteristics of communities, we can analyze the solar adoption patterns to inform policy design. And by integrating the, the solar PV maps and the electric vehicle charging demands, we can estimate the, we, we can analyze the integration of the EV question. Yeah, sorry, um, you only have a top view of the solar PV panel. So how are you estimating how much it's able to supply? How much, um, how much how much power is able to supply because you have to think about like the azimuth angle you have to think about all that sort of stuff oh yeah in so, another work we have integrated the 3d building data to okay. estimating the rooftop tilt to get a better estimation of the size of the solar pv okay okay and uh, also by combining the uh distribution grid map with the natural disaster maps like the white power rate we can estimate the Great vulnerability to the disasters. And in this project, we mainly focus on two applications. One is to combine heat solar, solar plus plus, and other two spatial layers to understand the solar adoption patterns across spaces and time. Another one is to integrate a deep grid with the wildfire risk to estimate the great vulnerability to wildfires. Now let's look in the first one. From the deep solar data, we can uh, establish the correlations between the solar deployment, deployment rate characterized by number of solar systems per thousand households. 
with the different demographic variables like average household income and population density. And we can see that the solar deployment rate actually increases with the average household income, but then saturated at a high income level. And uh, the uh, solar deployment rate also shows a nonlinear relationship with the population density. The first increases, then peak at around 1,000 people per square miles, and then decreases. And uh, those correlations are static. We also want to know the temporal variations. So we analyze this from the perspective of technology adoption life cycle. We use a classic adoption model that is called the bus model to characterize the adoption trajectories over time. And the bus model is controlled by a uh, differential equation, which is I will not go into detail here. But in generally speaking, bus model can be used to segment a adoption trajectory, a cumulative adoption trajectory trajectories into four phases. The first one is the pre-diffusion phase, which means there's no adoption at all. Then there's a ramp up, ramp up phase, which is from the on adoption onset to the peak of the growth rate. And then the ramp down, which is from the peak of the growth rate to the saturation. And finally, the saturation phase. And by grouping the communities into different income levels, like the low income level and the high income level. And for each level, we can plot the fraction of different com fraction of communities in each of the four phases. And we can find that in 2016, over 60% of high income communities had already started adoption, which means not in the pre-diffusion phase. But in, by contrast, this number is only 30% in low income communities. So that means that for low-income communities, there's the fraction of uh, communities that had not started adoption yet is more than that in high-income communities. But if we exclude this pre-diffusion part from the plot, we can only focus on those communities that have already started adoption. And uh, we can see that for low-income community in 2016, there are over 40% of communities that already entered the situation, but this number is only 30% in the high-income communities. And uh, we can also run a multivariate regression to see the correlation between the time of PV adoption onset and the saturation adoption level with different demographic features. And uh, we can see that Medium household income shows a negative correlation with the time of PV adoption onset, which means that higher income communities tend to adopt earlier. And uh, it also shows a positive correlation with the saturated adoption level, which means that higher income communities will have generally have higher saturated adoption level. So to summarize, compared to the high income communities, low income communities not just started adoption later, but also it's more likely to get saturated, but at a lower risk saturation level. And uh, we can also combine the deep, deep, the deep grid distribution, distribution grid map with the white file grid to investigate the vulnerability of grid to white files. And uh, as discussed before, we know that overhead power lines can ignite power lines and uh, can ignite white, white fires and are also vulnerable to fires. So why not burn all those lines on the ground? That is because the cost of on the ground power lines is very high. It is at a one and a million level of per mile to bury those on the ground power lines. So, and it is an order of magnitude higher than the cost of overhead power line. So we want to get to you know the status quo of the line burning status over different places to see whether the power lines are buried at the appropriate locations where people need them the most. So by, to do this, we apply our deep grid model on the two largest 
uh, on the territories of two largest utility companies in California, the PG&E and uh, Southern California uh, Edison. And then we can leverage our data to see different correlations of the uh, undergrounding rate. And we can see that undergrounding rate shows a positive correlation with medium household income conditional on different white file rates. Even on the high, high file risk regions, the higher, lower income communities also have lower fraction of power lines being on the ground. And also the underground rate exhibits a positive correlation with the, with the white file risk. But for the high, for the low density regions, the underground rate is generally low. Which is, but also insensitive to the white file risk. That means the white file risk was not fully considered in the blind wearing decision. So, and this is also reflected in our current policies of blind wearing, which is called Rule 20, Rule 20, made by California Public Utilities Commissions. And there are three different types of projects under this policy. The Rule 20A. Project, the cost is shared by, by the entire utility customers. But the eligibility criteria primarily focus on the aesthetic or convenience purposes, like whether the overhead grid affects the traffic on the streets. And for 20B or 20C projects, the cost is fully paid by or partially by the project applicants, like homeowners, local governments, and developers. So what can we find? So that means that for if people want to bury those lines for power for white power reason, they can only go to the low 20B or 20C. That means that for low-income communities, they need to pay the cost out of their own pocket. But for low-income communities, they may not be able to afford those costs by themselves. But low-income communities in the white power areas need the cost sharing the most, but neither the income level or the white power risk is considered as an eligibility criteria for the rule 28 for the cost sharing. So we hope that in the future, these things should be considered in the cost sharing to make the uh, protection of the white fires become more equitable across different communities. And our data set can also be used to localize those hotspot zones that need the priority for the investment or projects by combining the uh, household income map and the per household library cost, we can localize those regions with low income level but the high per household cost for burden power lines like Echo Lake, Groveland, Bakesfield, and the local communities over there may not be able to afford the line burden cost by themselves. So need the priority for the investment. So in summary, uh, the uh, energy atlas is a comprehensive map containing the geospatial layers at different sites. On the supply side, we have saw the spatial temporal mapping of the solar PV, like the deep solar, deep solar plus plus. And on the energy distribution map, we saw the distribution grid mapping by combining multimodal data. And the, on the people side, we saw the representation learning of the urban neighborhoods. And uh, we also saw the two applications, like by combining the uh, deep solar, deep solar plus plus, and the demographic, you see how we can use them to understand the solar adoption patterns across space, across time, and across different demographic communities. And uh, we also see that by com combining deep grid with the white power risk, we can review, we, we discuss the non-uniform grid vulnerability to white fires. And uh, there's to outlook forward, we can see there's a, uh, it is very promising to, uh, to see the marriage between the two different fields, the marriage between the machine learning and the sustainability. And there's a very good opportunity to leverage the machine learning, which is one of the most exciting uh, tools developed in the past decades to solve climate change, which is one of the most uh, significant challenges
basic human beings. Like machine learning can be applied to solve a variety of uh, tasks in the climate change and sustainability research, like the mapping, prediction, simulation, auto inference. And uh, solving the problems in the climate change and the sustainability research can also in turn ignite the uh, insights for the machine learning research from the physics informed machine learning, multimodal learning, machine learning boundaries. And also, we know that training large scale machine learning model will generate a huge amount of carbon emissions. So, if we can apply machine learning to solve the critical problems in reducing carbon emissions, then machine learning itself will be carbon neutral or even carbon negative. And in any case, I hope you're excited as me for the exploration of this cross disciplinary integration to create a more sustainable and intelligent world. And finally, I would acknowledge my advisors. I'm in the two research groups the uh, Ram, Professor Ram Rajagopal's group and uh, Professor Mujunda's group. And uh, I also want to thank to uh, my collaborators and those funding agencies and the institutes that provide the data and support me for my research. And that's it. Any questions? Uh, are the codes, the software code, are they somewhere so that students can use it to learn the I mean, the, the source code. The source code, yeah. Yeah, yeah. For, for example, for Deep Free, it is, on, it is publicly available on GitHub. There's a website. Oh. So we have an open platform, which also providing the different resources, including the data and the code to, the, to this project. Are you able to estimate like whether there are going to be substations and that type of, type of thing within the deep grid um, system or not really? Yeah, in the deep grid, we haven't estimated the location of substations yet, okay. but that is possible by leveraging like the remote sensing images. I think you, you just need to tell the you know, what kind of features mm -hmm. the substation. I think that's, that's cool. Other question, it's out of interest. I mean, uh, I, I can understand how this is a lot more scalable in terms of being able to get the information, but it, it seems like at the crux of it, this information should already be the person's I'm looking at like sort of PV data, I have to get a license to do that installation. So have you guys been able to find that data to correlate some of the something finding or how are you doing that? I mean correlating. Like is in you expect to say you, like you think that my solar panel in this area it has a capacity of 100 kilowatts, but actually in that area it might have a capacity of say 80 kilowatts. How are you confirming what you're estimating? You mean comparing like to oh. estimating the yeah. mismatch? Yeah, exactly. Do you, do you so, have any ground truth? Yeah, yeah the ground truth. Yeah. yeah, we are compelled them with the like we manually labeled the some first of all at the image level, we estimate the uh the performance, the accuracy of predicting whether this overall uh, solar panel in the image and compare it with the ground truth annotations. And they can achieve, like, for 90% of the system, it can be detected by our model. So, any, any more questions for students? You see the QA question? Yeah. Can you map the number of homes per home? of transformer in different areas and the remaining ability to electrify more homes. Yeah, we can because we have the green maps like covering different areas. So we can also overlay it with the building maps in different locations to get the, like we also have the solar maps. So we can estimate the capacity, like remaining capacity in different places, like to see whether it could be electrified more homes or provide the, to host the capacity of solar PV across different places. So that is could be the downstream applications for these maps generated by our, uh, our methods. Okay, good, thank you.